Well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now we've been going through Unit 3 of the AP Government Curriculum, and in this video, it's time to turn the corner and start talking about civil rights. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, well then let's get to it. So in this video, here's what we're trying to do. Explain how constitutional provisions have supported and motivated social movements. Okay, now before we get into that, let me make a distinction that might help clear up some confusion. Over the course of all these Unit 3 videos, we've been talking about civil liberties that are guaranteed to Americans via the Bill of Rights. Those liberties include the right to free speech and free exercise of religion, religion, the right to a lawyer in court, etc, etc. But in this video, we're going to be talking about civil rights, and that is not the same thing as civil liberties, so let me just say it simply. Civil liberties are those rights guaranteed to every American citizen by the Constitution. Civil rights movements make sure that every American, regardless of sex, religion, or race, has equal access to those liberties. And the main way that civil rights activists have attempted to apply those rights to everyone is through the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment. So whenever you're thinking about civil rights, you need to automatically connect that with the 14th Amendment. Get that neural pathway fixed and strong because you're going to need it for the exam. Okay, let's talk about civil rights movements, and although there have been many throughout the history of America, we're going to start in the 1950s with the movement from which all the others afterward got their inspiration, namely the Civil Rights Movement for the Equality of Black Americans. Now, after the Civil War, the 13th Amendment was passed, which formally abolished slavery in the United States, which meant that constitutionally every former enslaved laborer in the South was now a citizen of the United States. However, if you know anything about the history of those tumultuous years, you'll know that after the end of Reconstruction in 1877, southern states very much reverted to the old racial hierarchy and oppression that characterized the South before the war. And despite the fact that southern states were required to ratify the 14th Amendment in order to be readmitted into the Union, they found ways to disenfranchise and marginalize black southerners. And this happened with the rise of restrictive rules called black codes and societal segregation via Jim Crow laws. So despite the fact that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments recognized black citizens as fully equal to white citizens, that's not really how it played out in reality. And so coming into the 1950s, a formal movement began to emerge, and one of the key figures of this movement was a preacher from Georgia named Martin Luther King Jr., and he made a name for himself during the Montgomery bus boycott starting in 1955. King advocated an approach to civil rights defined by nonviolent protest, and many of his followers did so. Now, to be fair, there were other more militant black rights movements under the leadership of Malcolm X and the Black Panthers, which advocated for black separatism, but we're focusing on the civil rights movement under King's leadership because they argued for the rights of black Americans explicitly on the basis of the Constitution. In fact, as I mentioned before, it was largely the 14th Amendment that spurred this group into action. Clearly, Jim Crow segregation was an attempt to bypass the Equal Protection Clause of that amendment, and the devotees of the Civil Rights Movement aimed to make that right. If you want a clear insight into King's nonviolent philosophy, then there's no better place to go than to one of your required documents for this course, namely, a letter from a Birmingham jail. Now, as with every required document in this course, I have a whole video exploring the details of it, but for now, just let me give you the the gist of it. On this occasion, King and some other leaders of the civil rights movement were arrested for parading without a permit, which they did in order to protest Birmingham's deep segregationist laws. And while he was in jail, a group of white clergymen, who were, to be fair, sympathetic to the cause of civil rights, published a letter in the newspaper saying that black protesters ought not be out parading like that. Instead, they should wait and allow sympathetic white folks to take up their cause for them. And so King's letter from jail was his response to their admonition, and he said this, Only those who have not been under the degree lash of racism can rightly say, wait, the time for action is now, and while racist laws must be fought in court, they must also be protested on the streets, because only in that way can they force the white majority to confront their racism and enter into a dialogue about long-term change. Now, the civil rights movement earned some potent victories, and that's what we're going to consider in the next video, but for now, let's just consider some of the other movements for civil rights that grew out of the soil of the movement for black equality. First, how about we talk about the women's rights movement in the 1960s and the 1970s? So a huge victory for women was the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, which formally recognized women's right to vote. But even so, there were still a lot of ways that women were marginalized in U.S. society. Like, for example, courts could still seat all male juries, and women were generally paid less for equal work. And so in order to right some of these wrongs, the National Organization for Women, or NOW, was founded in 1966. Partly, this group emerged because of a book called The Feminine Mystique, written by Betty Friedan and published in 1963. In that book, Friedan exposed, through interviews with women, the 
drudgery and hopelessness that came with constantly submitting to their predetermined societal roles as nothing more than mothers and wives and homemakers whose greatest glory in life was making their husband a sandwich. Additionally, Now was energized by the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which banned discrimination based on sex, but it was weakly enforced on that count. A major goal of the women's rights movement was to pass something called the Equal Rights Amendment, which said, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States by any state on account of sex. However, thanks to the lobbying efforts of conservative women represented by Phyllis Schlafly, the ERA fell short of the required number of states necessary for ratification. Even so, the women's rights movement did win a victory in the passage of the Education Amendments Act in 1962, particularly Title IX of that act, which guaranteed that women would have the same opportunities as men in educational institutions that receive federal funding. Then in the 1970s and 1980s, another civil rights movement sprang up, dealing with the rights of the LGBTQ community. In those days, homosexuality was still defined as a mental illness, and many states had laws that discriminated against gay men and women. For example, into the 90s, if you were gay, you could not serve in the military. Now, President Clinton promised to reverse this in his campaign speeches, but found that once he was elected, his generals were very much against against him on this count, so he instituted the don't ask, don't tell policy, which is exactly what it sounds like. Under this policy, gay men and women could serve in the military, but just don't tell anyone you're gay and we won't ask. That policy reigned until the presidency of Barack Obama, who led Congress to do away with don't ask, don't tell, and as a result, people of any sexual orientation could now serve in the military. And then yet another civil rights movement that sprang up in the 1970s was the right to life movement that opposed abortion. This, of course, came in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade, on which I have a whole video. But for now, you just need to know that the Roe decision made abortion on demand legal in the first trimester without restriction across the United States. And those who are members of the women's rights movement consider this a big victory, but a growing group of Catholics and white evangelical Christians rose up to oppose it. By 1980, these groups had melded their cause with the Republican Party's platform against abortion, and their main argument was that from the moment of conception, that entity in a woman's womb was actually, in fact, a human being. And as such, that human baby ought to have equal protection of the laws just like like any other American did. And this group worked hard to reverse the effects of Roe v. Wade, and they did have some success, but not as much as they would like. One of the big pushes was for something called the Hatch Amendment, named after Senator Orrin Hatch, who proposed it. Basically, this was a proposed amendment to the Constitution that would restrict abortion. And it would do so by mandating that whichever abortion law was more restrictive, whether state or federal law, that would be the binding law in any given state. And despite much enthusiasm for the right to life movement regarding this amendment, it ultimately did not pass. So the point to all the movements that I've just mentioned is this. These civil rights movements are evidence of how the Equal Protection Clause can support and motivate social movements for civil rights. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Click right here to view packet, which is going to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. Additionally, if you were helped by this video and you want me to keep making them, then by all means, subscribe and I shall oblige. Heimler out.